Welcome, everybody. First of all, before we start today's session, happy Chinese national holidays. Um, Manfred and I are still working during these national holidays, although probably the majority of our teams are on vacation, either visiting Shanghai Disneyland, which my team are. Um, but I do want to welcome you uh, during this, this one week break that we have, um, at least our China teams have, uh, for the national festivities. This week, we, Manfred and I, are going to be presenting on China market entry 2022-2023, to go or not to go. And this is really the big question at the moment. Manfred and I did this presentation in January um, because we actually had such a phenomenal year in 2020, 2021 in terms of growth and companies, leaders pushing their investments into the Chinese market. But who would have thought that come April, May, June, there would have been such a lockdown in China that would have brought everything to a standstill. So Manfred and I thought we would come back together and do this same presentation because again, although China has opened itself up and we're getting more and more people interested in going in, there is still this fear um, and maybe lack of knowledge of what one can and cannot do um, when going in. So the whole point of this workshop series is that in today's session, we're going to look at market potential, market research. Manfred is going to lead off on that presentation. Tomorrow, we're going to be looking at the different business models, how to think about your financial budget. And then on day three, on Wednesday, we're going to be looking at ecosystem. Who do you need in your ecosystem to push your China project forward? And day four is actually just an interaction. It's actually a Q&A, a live interaction where we hope to be able to get an action plan ready for you on at least what are your next three steps after participating in this workshop. So just before we start introducing ourselves and what we do, um, how the webinar works is we're here to educate you. If you have questions, and please remember with China, there is no dumb question. Please feel free to ask them in the chat box. I have muted everybody so that we can go through the presentation. Um, and have, and then be open for a QA and a um, at the end. But remember, no dumb question when it comes to China, ask away. That's what this whole workshop series is about, is that you have Manfred and I who, in conjunction, probably have over 40 years of experience in China. And, uh, you know, that's what we're here for, right? This is your time spent. We're going to try our best to keep each session to about 60 minutes. We might run over depending on the amount of questions that that. Okay. Um, the webinar, this webinar is really geared towards newbies and startups in China. Uh, newbies are those of you that have found an opportunity in the Chinese market and you're looking to gain an education on what you can do with that opportunity. Some of you might be startups in China, meaning you've already transacted with the Chinese market. And the question now is, how do you scale that? How do you grow on this initial startup that you've achieved? Um, and just to start kicking off on the interaction in the chat box, if you would let us know if you're a newbie or a startup, some of you might also be China experienced hands. If you are, you know, right, newbie, startup, China experienced hand, we would love to know who is in the audience, um, who is in the audience today. What we're covering, like I said, is today is market share, market potential opportunities. What do you do with that? Um, Data, data, data is going to be the word of today. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to be talking about business models, financial resources. Wednesday is ecosystem. Who do you need in your network? And then session four is really getting three action points of what are you going to do next? Manfred and I are huge, huge believers in execution. Uh, execution can only be done if you have knowledge, uh, pertaining to the Chinese market on how to do business, what can you do, et cetera. Uh, but execution is fundamental, it's key. And this is where we see a lot of companies blocked and at an obstacle with that step. So session four is all about execution. 
So just to introduce myself, and then I'm going to hand it over to Manfred. My name is Christina kohler Colucci. I'm the head of business advisory at Woodburn Accountants and Advisors. Um, I haven't updated the slide. I've got now 18 and a half years of experience in China. Um, and my expertise and speciality is in helping foreign investors with their market entry and their expansion and growth in China, as well as in Hong Kong. Um, one of the beautiful things that I have seen over the last 18 odd years is the fact that where it was the wild, wild west in 2002, 2003, times have changed uh, where China has really developed system processes um, and optimized its procedures, if you will, in terms of all corporate compliance steps, administrative steps, regulations, etc making it a lot, lot easier for foreign investors um, to get into China. And I completely understand that for some of you, this might still be in 2022, the wild, wild west, um, but you can imagine 18, 20 years ago, how, how different it was back then. Um, what we do at Woodburn Accountants and Advisors is we help um, strategize. We do pre-investment advisory, we actually implement structures on the ground, either direct with the HQ or with entities on the ground. And then we provide all of the administrative services around that structure. So if you've got any questions on that, don't hesitate to reach out. And then I'm gonna leave it off to Manfred, who's gonna to start today's presentation. I'm gonna take control of the participants and any questions um, that, that do pop in. Wonderful. Manfred? <clears throat> Thank you so much, Christina. Um, let me go ahead and uh, screen share. Um, is that working? Do you see the full screen, Christina? Perfect. Yes, yes, yes. All right. Similar as Christina, I'll just uh, say a couple of, of short words to myself um, and then kind of I'll, I'll go into the topics. Christina and myself, we've, we've entered China kind of at, at similar times. Um, I've been active there since back in 2003. Um, I used to live and work up in northeastern China, moved on to, to Beijing, um, where I lived, worked and studied, and uh, then did um, quite a lot of project management until back in um, 2015, going up to about 100 million kind of in the region of Shanghai, Nanjing, and uh, Wuhan, or at least mainly in that region. Ever since then, kind of the things we had noticed in, as, as uh, Christina had put it, um, the glorious or the, or the gold days, people have always been an issue. have always been a critical issue. They, they're everywhere. They are, you know, especially now these days, all of us know that. Um, and that kind of turned us into the direction of, of executive search. So that's what we do. We find kind of the right heads for your organizations. Could be a sales oriented general manager, could be um, a plant manager, could also be the technical managers of your operations, or just at the moment we're covering a CFO out in Uxi. Those are the sort of um, arrangements that we, or the sort of candidates that we're looking for. Additional to that, my organization, the China Search, or at least that's the China brand on it, also has an operational unit that's kind of looking into sales role, project manager roles, even you know going down to service technicians, which are um, the bread and, and butter people, so to speak, you know, the people that you need in order to actually run, run your organization. Enough said about myself though. That's a couple of slides on the um, on what we do. The key point for today really is what the key point for today is some of you out there, you might want to go into China, you might have already done your first steps, but still every now and then, you know, is a little bit cloudy, is a little bit misty, especially now we've had this kind of tumultuous two and a half years where most of us were not able to go to China. So maybe the mist is even a little bit, a little bit more than usually. So the goal for today is to, you know, increase the, the light or increase the clarity to understand, you know, which, which mountains do you want to climb, which peaks you want to go on to. So I brought kind of three topics because at the end of the day, when we say market potential, we need to understand a couple of things, right? 
And I think one of those things we should really understand is customers, which if we don't understand it, it's really hard to, to, to gauge the customer potential or the market potential. The second thing where some of times European companies have actually challenges, especially if they, if they start or if they're in the early phase, is the value proposition. You know, sometimes we come from our own reality, we have that at the back of our mind, and, and we assume that automatically that reality translates into another reality, but quite often it doesn't. And this third thing is about competitors, which, you know, apparently China being the single largest market worldwide, there's going to be a few of them. So, you know, let's kick into it. If we look at China and, you know, now I'm talking about a, a typical SME client of, of ours, a rather small one. If we say your global revenue is 10 million, then pretty soon you could be doing probably about 30% of that revenue in China. And many of our clients do that. We've got some that do more, we've got some that do a little bit less, but a little bit less means, you know, talking about 15, talking about 20%. But also just recently, you know, we had a, a request from a client in MedTech who was doing about 66% of their revenue in China. So I'm just saying, even if you're starting out pretty soon, most likely is going to be a strategic market. And with that, you know, also most of the time your profits can be quite large because depending on the product, depending on the industry, the, the margins in China are still better. If you're a bit of a larger organization, you know, then it could be looking like doing 10 million out of 50 million in China and essentially getting 30% of your profit share out of China. And I think because of this, it is a good idea to, you know, take the time for example, this week, or take the time to speak to people like Christina, is not just a other market. If it really is a market for you, then most likely it's a strategic market. And it's going to be a market that if you treat it well and take care of it, that will also take care of you. But it's also a market that just by, you know, sitting somewhere in Europe or sitting somewhere in the US or in Australia or anywhere else in the world and just hoping that something happens, at least from my experience, most of the time, it, 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 really, it really doesn't. So as we've all known, you know, it's, it's quite huge, right? 1.4 billion people, that's a lot. Sorry, Manfred, can I interrupt you? If you, sure. if, you, if you just go to the previous slide. Manfred and I will probably do this back and forth a little bit during these presentations, um, just because we, we share insights into all of this. I, I just want to say, you know, all of my clients, when they're establishing their subsidiaries in China, their subsidiary starts at zero, meaning revenue is at zero, right? They have options in terms of having that revenue sit in their home jurisdiction, eventually putting some of that revenue into the Chinese operation, but everybody started with revenue at zero. Okay, because that's how you start your business. You have to do the first couple of transactions and then you build off on it. What Manfred is showing with these two examples in terms of it being a strategic market is that this is how quickly somebody can grow in China within even just a year of operating. Okay, so within just a year of operating, you could make 3 million euros just in the Chinese market if you're thinking so carefully about the strategy and the plan. And, and how you're planning on, on, on operating. Obviously, if you're a large organization, it might go faster than that, but that's how quickly it could happen. I think, I think there's really two things to focus on here. The first thing is kind of, it's so big. So, you know, getting the customers right, getting the value proposition right and the message to them, that's the one thing. And the other thing is China's got these five year strategic plans from kind of a country level. And it's like, you know, if you enter the right time, and they just started to, to go after a certain topic or after a certain product or a certain technology kind of full speed, and you're sitting atop a rocket. Mm. You know, we're, we're, we're not kind of painting a, a pink castle here. It's just stories that we've seen, that we've experienced. Um, and yes, if you know what you're doing, it's, it's quite realistic, it's quite possible, it's quite feasible. But of course, the reason why we do this is because we also see a lot of people kind of stumbling and a lot of people just going about it in, in ways that don't work. 
And that is one of our motivations here to, you know, speak to you and to share our experience to, um, to understand that. Better. Yeah. Thanks, Manfred. Sure, absolutely. So, you know, this picture here is, you know, it's just a normal one. It's just a normal China picture. So the question, if you're starting, if you are at zero, what, what Christina just said, is like, who of these guys is your client? Is he there? Is she there? You know, is it the 30 year olds? Is it the 60 year olds? Is it, who is it? We all have that question, or we all have an answer to that question in, in Europe. But what I see a lot is that we, out of, what, out of different reasons, we don't kind of take the time to answer this question in China. So far away, so many reasons not to do it, so busy writing emails. You know, that's, that's the base. That's kind of where you need to start. If you're a Starbucks, that client profile obviously looks fundamentally different as if you're trying to sell railroads or railways or aeroplanes, or if you're trying to sell, I don't know, houses. It's just different, right? And so what we really need to do, and we do that in all other markets, right? So this is not rocket science, what I'm saying, it's just the basics, really. We need to segment a little bit. We need to understand who are the people we want to reach. Why? Because 1.4 billion people is very tempting when you kind of think, what if, you know, every third would buy my product? If you go into marketing spend, it turns around. You know, if you want to do have a marketing spend that you can reach everyone because you don't know who your customer is, that will be, you know, a bit of a showstopper in terms of your budget. And, and this is what we kind of want to have. We, we want to have focus. So you look at, for example, these three different people, and you kind of immediately see that, that obviously they're different, right? When we look here at the gentleman in the middle, kind of a smart professional who is the head of the Airpods Innovation Center in, in Tianjin, could be him if you have some sort of aerospace technology kind of to offer or products that you sell to, to Airbus or to Boeing, or that is, it's that side sort of person, right? If you look at the right hand side, you've got a foreign executive in China, kind of seasoned, coming from the early days where China was very much about kind of cost effective production, that sort of thing. Um, obviously, these experts, you know, you'll be reaching them in a different way. And then on the left hand side, you have Mr. Mr. Ho, who were kind of used to be the number two at, at Suning, a Chinese company with 180,000 employees. So you can sell something to all of them, obviously. The idea is just, or the question is just, who would be, you know, the most reasonable person to, to approach with what you want to sell? Um, and if maybe, you know, If we talk about target groups, you know, that could translate into foreign aerospace multinationals in China, or it could translate into European low cost manufacturing in China, or it could translate into, into large scale Chinese companies. I think no matter, Christina, later on, after I'm finished with my part, she'll add a couple of things on the, you know, where to get the data, companies out there, partners out there, that kind of stuff. Um, or also doing the research kind of at your own desk. But something that you always kind of need to keep in mind is, um, you know, you need to segment that market. You can't say there's about 700 million women in China. So I've got shoes to sell. So there's 700 million potential people that could buy my shoes, particularly made for women. You know, there is a total addressable market. That is one thing, like that kind of that big number. But then you also need to keep in mind that, you know, you have the pyramid. You have the premium segment, you have the middle segment, the bottom segment. And very often the Europeans, they kind of, 
When you look at their stuff, what they have, they go at the premium. When you look at the market evaluations, they kind of take the total addressable market. They take all people. And this is like, you know, a huge mistake because it completely distorts your reality. If you've got a premium product, all right, you know, and let's take the 700 million women and then let's take maybe 1% of that or one promille of that. And then, you know, we've got a clearer picture. So we're talking about maybe a very fashionable Shanghainese lady who has been traveling abroad, who, you know, has international friends, that sort of thing, who is willing to spend the thousand dollars on that pair of shoes. All right, but that then is a clear picture that we can work with. And that also gives us, you know, the focus that we need. So if we look at kind of, um, if we look at that from a B2C focus here, the recipe meaning, this is the slides that you can then use and later on kind of go through yourself. Um, that's what you can take home because the whole idea of this week is not to give you all answers as you know there's a very diverse audience here is more kind of to give you and offer you the cookbook so here you know which gender are we talking about um, which age are we talking about you know china is very digitalized but obviously a 20 or a 30 year old will spend much more time on the phone than a 70 year old you just have to keep it in mind you know because it will it will influence your decisions something that's also a large topic is kind of, you know, where are your customers? Are they just in Shanghai? Are they just on the East Coast? Are they just in the big cities? Or are your customers those that kind of come from the smaller cities? Like in, in the beginning of this year, I remember we had a, a client here on the webinars that was looking for education marketing. And they kind of intentionally looked at tier two and tier three cities where the kids of very wealthy families, but maybe with not the best sort of background education would be interested in entering kind of the UK education system. You know, that sort of thing. So the, the demographics obviously are very important, right? I mean, one question always, always, always important is what's the local alternative? Yes, there's 1.4 billion people. Yes, theoretically, they all could be Starbucks clients. But no, historically, they drink tea. So, you know, you, you want to at least understand that a little bit and, and see why, or not why, at least see <clears throat> what are they buying or consuming at the moment. You know, you can laugh about it. You might not like it. But still, you know, in order to be successful on the market, at least you have to, I think, have a, a certain understanding. If we look at the same thing kind of from the B2B perspective, then the questions change a little bit. You know, understanding their pain point would help. Um, understanding also why they would not want to buy that premium European quality product. That is a hard question for most of us that haven't been in China or that haven't done China a lot. Uh, but it's a question that leads to a lot of insight. You know, once you understand that, you, you get an understanding on your local competitors and not just kind of on your perceived international competitors. Because there's so many companies that say, yeah, but it's only really two companies in the world that can do it at this level. You know, that sort of perspective, it, it leads you on the wrong track because you're looking at the wrong stuff. You're, you're, you're kind of coming with that, you know, you're, you're coming with a cloud of, it's only us that's great. The question is more like, you know, what's the range of solutions that's out there? And why is it that 99% of the time they take the other solution? And when you have it, when you look at it that way, then you can get a better understanding really on what, um, what the market looks like. And that's what you need. You need that feeling for the market to see how you move, right? If you don't have that feeling for the market, it's going to be tricky for you. Obviously, looking at customer journeys, especially if you have expensive um, projects, expensive technologies, you know, large capex investments in a climate where maybe you know the, the investment readiness is is going down, which really means you need to have more um, convincing arguments and a better understanding of the customer journey. 
Also, you know, how can you identify them easily? They are out there. You know, you, you can create these leads. There is sometimes similar, sometimes different ways. So that's just a couple of, you know, questions that you can ask yourself after the webinar um, to kind of get a better understanding of your customers. The value proposition. How do we look like on that one? Very often, you know, people come in if we're kind of talking about a sort of product and, and, and not, not something to eat or something to drink. And they say, you know, we're a European market leader. And they say it's the highest quality on a European level. It lasts for ages and we're in the little leader in total cost of ownership, which is all, you know, terribly cute. It doesn't really help because from the Chinese perspective, how does it look like, you know? From Chinese perspective, it looks like they are capable to quite easily get information from Europe. Why? Because there's simply, you know, a lot of Chinese people living in Europe these days. So you ask a couple of them and, you know, get an understanding. You are this tiny, tiny, tiny company and you go to China kind of claiming that you're the European market leader and you are extremely far from it. You know, it's, it's kind of the first blow. And it's a blow that, you know, very often is not necessary. Uh, you can take it, all right. Highest quality, you know, is another one. If you're going for that, you know, that premium, premium, premium segment of shoes and hence a very small group of Chinese women, then maybe the sort of highest quality appeal is the right one. If you're going for investment goods, it really depends. Why? There's, in Chinese, there's a saying that change is faster than planning. If your client, whom you're trying to sell to something in the range of a couple of millions, is you know changing his mind all the time, is changing his business all the time, is changing business model all the time, they might not be interested in something that's you know so that's kind of booking them in on something where they need to say I I do that the next ten years because they don't know what they're doing in three years down the line. So you got to think about that. That's the same thing, you know, in terms of lasts for ages. Even if you go to technology, China is kind of a market where it, it's not really about lasting for ages. It's about a very cost-effective solution for the problem now. And in two years, you buy a new one. Or in four years, you buy a new one, you know? Very often, that European perspective is, you know, it, it needs to last a very long time. And very often that is not the Chinese perspective. So kind of going back to the previous slide, you know, you want to think about it, how you position yourself. Because again, if you use that sort of, let's call it the standard positioning that I see, then you're addressing a smaller market segment. You might have issues in actually convincing them on your propositions. And then, you know, sales will be just much harder, right? If your value proposition is, is not very good, you need much more salespeople, hence a much larger budget, and your quotas will be, will be worse. And I think, you know, you can do better if you think about it a little bit more upfront, if you find the right positioning, um, and then you just, you know, you can keep on going and you can keep on selling. And that is then also the thing where Christina said, you know, it can, it can move quickly. But it also means you need to do your homework. If you, if you just enter by not knowing who's out there, not knowing whom you're competing against, um, then you will not be able to do that. If you know that you're only competing against one European player and 20 Chinese players, and you know most of them, then it's different. Um, also, you know, things like leadership in, in cost of ownership, that is something very long-term. It's nice that you have that, but it's also you need to also understand the realities. Again, if you have 1.4 billion people, then labor is obviously easier to come by than in Europe. And, and that is something, you know, whenever you go into the market, you, you need to develop a little bit of an understanding of that market. To give you, again, a picture, what you see here kind of is a very Chinese way of a scaffold. 
is made of bamboo. And that's nothing special. And that doesn't mean that China is backward. And it doesn't mean that this solution is bad. What it really means is it's a local solution, is a solution that's widely used, is a solution that works. Why? Because you have a lot of bamboo growing in China. It's as simple as that. And that's what I mean when I say, you know, look at the local solutions. Don't go there and say, that is stupid, that is not my competitor. That is your competitor if you're doing scaffolds, right? Because that's what most of the people use, or that's what many people use. And this is kind of what you need to understand, that you, you're not looking for exactly the same thing. You're looking for the same situation, and you're looking to understand what are the local solutions. And then you can work your way backwards, and then you can see where do I fit in? Do I want to cater to that sort of scenario or not? You know, it's all right if you don't want to cater to it. Just understand that these sort of scenarios are then kind of 80, 90% of the market. And this is where the numbers play kind of comes together. You know, when you look at these big numbers, like 1.4 billion people and so many billions in revenue and this and that, you know, most of that is kind of in the middle segment and is in the, in the, in the bottom segment. And this is what you kind of need to, to look at a little bit and figure with yourself, your teams, your organization, where do we fit in? Um, you know, you want to consider that China is a very price sensitive market. You, you just, you know, randomly add premiums, that's tricky. Um, I think as the picture previously showed, you know, it's important to understand that local reality. Know that local reality is not always extremely different, but very often it is. You know, you take, you take Tesla, you take self-driving cars. You know, the Chinese reality on the road is so different that companies like Tesla, companies like Audi, they cannot take that same sort of developed algorithm that they use here in Europe in order to then implement it in China. It's just so many small things that lead to a different reality. And that is important. Customer service. I always say, you know, you've ever been to an Asian hotel, you've ever been to an Asian hotel in Asia, you might have an idea on how customer service can actually be like. Then you go back to Central Europe, you go back to Germany, you check into a hotel. And you just make sure that you run out as fast as you can. That difference is huge is extremely, extremely, extremely big. And that is something that is hard for us Europeans to, to get right, meaning to do it at a similar level as Chinese competitors could do it. Uh, but if you think that that sort of normal Central European way of customer service will be sufficient for China, um, then I'm pretty sure you will never reach these 30%. Uh, it's easy to look at that because you need to look at the times. How fast do you deal with client issues? Do you really tackle them? Do you solve them? You know, Essentially, what you want is you take these software as a service companies, you look at how fast they are, you look at how they deal with kind of um, customer issues, and this is where you need to be. This is the sort of, you know, level that you should be bringing to the game, even if you're kind of a bit more traditional. Um, the next one is something, if you only kind of take one thing with you, then maybe it's this one that many Chinese customers would like to have 80% of that European quality at 60% of your price. Um, that's a bit of a bugger because, you know, normally you can't just reduce it to 80%. It's not so easy. But even if you can, it's not so easy then to get it at 60% of your price. But if you have that expectation in mind when you go into the market, um, that might be useful and, and helpful for you. Um, and the last one, you know, the Chinese market is, is very fast moving. It's very fast moving with all the good and with all the not so good um, aspects that, that, that come with this. Um, so I think you want to prepare for a little bit of flexibility. Or put differently, if you already have a team in China, if you think about having a team in China, you need to listen to them. 
you know, they, they, they'll tell you that. It's the same thing here in Europe, you know, the people who are touch with the client, they will have a good understanding on where is it going? What do we need kind of as product next generation, that sort of thing. In China, even more so, you know, listen to them, include them, listen to them. Yeah. Okay, what do you want to, in terms of the value proposition? Uh, what can you do? What can you do as a homework, you know? Get feedback on your idea from, from Chinese in Europe or from people who lived in China. Create an ideal client profile, you know? As I did, if you have pictures, use pictures. So many things will fall into place once you have a picture. But also, you know, as many attributes as, as, as you can put down. Um, and if you already ask, have, have clients, you know, ask them yourself, you know? Why did you buy? Why didn't you buy? Who are the other ones? that you kind of buy from, that gives you very quickly an, an understanding on the range. Yeah? Local alternatives, I think, depending on what you're doing, you know, industry fairs could help you to understand them. The internet could help you to understand them. Other, you know, people within your, your industry um, could help you to understand them. And I've seen in the past, you know, I've seen organizations like National Instruments, which is an American organization. It's got an extremely strong sales unit and sales organization in China. You know, they, they take these things very serious. They don't kind of say, ah, you know, it's a commit. When they see that they lose too much deals against the competitor, they, they go in depth, you know, they kind of try and understand their competitor really well to see where do they have an angle? What can they do? Where, where can they attack? that sort of thing. Um, obviously, you know, benchmarking is, is, is something that's very easy and, and that will help you. Um, and if you, you know, benchmark the local competitors, look at cost and product quality. You need to look at both when, when, when you go up against them. It's not, it's a little bit like Apple comparing apples and bananas. And that's why you need also to, to, to look at that. Christina, I hope I'm still kind of roughly in time. Let me speed up a little bit kind of on the, on the last slides and then we can, can run into um, kind of a conversation or see if there's some questions out there. You know, in terms of the competitors, obviously something you'll need to know when you enter. This is again, that example with the scaffold, right? On the right-hand side, you see the kind of Chinese bamboo scaffold. On the left-hand side, you see the scaffold of uh, an Austrian company that's uh, that's doing that and that has sold successfully in China. So understand it, keep it in mind. Um, now we go to data. I think, you know, as, as much as I don't want personally Google to have all my data and know everything about myself, uh, the beauty of having data is you, you, you can look at it. And once you, you have a little bit of a data, um, actually is not so difficult, right? You don't need to have a team in China or a company in China to have data. At least this is my understanding. But obviously, you know, as soon as you have a team, everything will become easier. We have many clients that they sell to China uh, and then they just see that, you know, it's growing. Any sort of thing that you can put together, you know, where do you sell to? Do we talk about cities? Do we talk about industries? Do we talk about company names? Do we talk about use cases? You know, from an IT perspective, it's, it's all just tables, really. It's just trying to understand, you know, where are you selling to? And very often what happens is that, you know, we don't have that structure in place. And so we don't know where to put it. So what we do is, we don't put it anywhere. We just write the bill, we're happy that we get the money, and then we don't know. So if upfront, you know, you take a little bit your, your analysis tables kind of from other markets and you adapt them to China to see kind of, you know, what is important, what do we need to look at, which regions, because that's then, once you start building your team, that will give you a lot of information. And that will, you know, it will be very easy then than to, to, to focus. Um, obviously, you know- Ma Ma Manfred, can I just interrupt on that point? 
I think it's also very important to analyze inquiry data. Um, Manfred was talking a lot about the sales data. Uh, I'm also talking a lot about inquiries. So uh, the actual opportunities, you know, you might not actually be transacting yet with China, but you are getting a flood of inquiries for your products. Nothing is materializing. Well, why? So it's also tracking these inquiries that are coming in. Who are they coming from? Where are they coming from? Are they coming from inter intermediaries or end clients? How is that being tracked? And why is there no execution on them, right? So it's not just sales data of actual transactions that are occurring, but it's also the inquiry data that I think is also very fundamental at the start of, um, of the business. And just one extra question I would add in there is, is there recurring? sales. Um, so, you know, you might have a transaction that's occurring with a client. Does it happen again? When does it happen? How often does it happen? Um, this recurring data is also very, very critical. Sorry, Manfred, I just wanted to add that in. No, no, obviously, absolutely, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, it's, it's really the whole sales funnel, like Christina said, you have the inquiry coming in on top, and then you have the deals at the bottom. That will automatically, like just the point that Christina made, it will automatically point to competitors. Because every inquiry that you receive, we have a CRM system where if we close down a sales deal and if it's lost, you know, it asks, why did we lose it? So you need, you know, you need to put something in. And that sort of habit, that sort of, um, yeah, that's what it is. It's a habit. You can then later analyze it, yeah? And when you say, ah, we've lost it because we've been too expensive. Or we've lost it because we've been too slow. We said, you know, it will, you will already have the product in three months. And the Chinese client will go like, three and, and I just want to say, this all sounds like common sense. We realize that it is common sense. But when you are exploring a new market, and you know we're here today for China, right? China is the new market that you're planning on expanding to, or you, you're seeing the opportunities that are there. Um, what we are finding is that as we are talking to clients about their growth and expansion in the market, and we go back to these questions, nobody keeps a track record. So I know that this is common sense. We know that the CR, having a CRM is common sense. We know that having data is, is fundamental. But for some reason, China somehow escapes people's minds that they don't keep track of things from the very beginning, from that first inquiry that, in, that occurred. Uh, I don't know why. I don't know why that there is this mindset, but it's just, it does not happen. So make sure you start data analysis and data entry literally from day one of the first ever inquiry you receive, the first interest you ever receive. You know, we, 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 we've observed this kind of phenomenon for so many years, I, I started to call it the Mallorca syndrome, that people just somehow behave differently when it comes to China. Um, and again, you know, I, I beg to differ between this is common sense and it's easy to implement. Just because it's common sense doesn't mean that it's easy to implement. And that is why Christina and me keep stressing these points because you need to implement it. Like literally, I do not care that you understand that it's important. I care that you've implemented it. And, and that is the thing, right? So do not walk away from this kind of webinar thinking, oh, they're just talking about common sense. No, what we're saying is that if you do that, your life will be much easier and your growth in China will be much faster. Why? Because we, we see it, you know, we accompany these companies on a daily basis. Um, and obviously, you know, data, data does help. Another thing that kind of a lot of companies are really struggling with, if you're in the, in the, in the product business, um, is really product market fit. Because of different realities, because of different habits, because of different things people pay attention to, there is many products that simply do not fit the Chinese market. So we start with this and then we add a dose of, but you know, we are really the market leader. And you've kind of got a dynamic where people do not want to look, people do not want to think, people are not willing 
to see how they can solve that. And that is the real showstopper. Once you have the organization at a point where they say, oh, maybe that product actually doesn't fit the market, then it's fairly easy to redesign. But to, to come to this point takes most organizations a very long time. So, you know, if, if you haven't entered yet, you know, look at that, take that a kind of as big thing and take it seriously. Um, if you have already entered, you know, just, just, just check yourself. Um, if, if that means, you know, and if you have many different products, obviously, you know, a, sing, a sing, simple ABC analysis will kind of show you which products are selling really well and which products, that, sorry, don't. Obviously, again, you should be needing data for that. Um, and again, the solution, as always, at least in my experience, is very simple. You know, talk to your Chinese sales guys. They will let you understand. At least they will share their perspective. I'm not saying that everything they say is right, but I'm just saying, listen to them, you know, and take them seriously. Don't, don't go at them like, you know, ah, oh, but, you know, we've always done it like this. With this sort of attitude, with this sort of behavior, you really discourage them to actually, you know, to move the organization ahead. Please, Christina, I see you. <laughs> I'm on the verge of saying something. Um, I just want to differentiate one thing regarding Chinese sales guys, because you can have your own team of Chinese salespeople that you are training and building in-house, but potentially at the China market entry phase, you don't, you're not hiring this team yourself. You're actually collaborating with distributors or other third parties. And in many instances, what I'm finding, and obviously the pandemic has not helped this situation, is that distributors may not necessarily, they may have experience with your products, but they may not necessarily know how to sell the more premium side of the products. And I have one client in my mind right now that I just want to share is they are, because Manfred used the word instruments, they are also an instrument business. Um, and they have a variety of different categories of products all the way from the basics to the premium ones. And their experience thus far in China through the distributor has been the distributor is fantastic at selling the basic set of instruments and really nothing from a premium side. And they're noticing just by speaking to him that there is no confidence to sell the premium products. He does not have the experience of talking to end customers on really how to sell the full portfolio, which is why they have decided to actually bring in their own guys to work in parallel with the distributor to join meetings to be able to spread this knowledge level, okay? So um, just to say that from a market entry stage, it could very well be you're using third parties and they, they just don't know how to sell certain aspects of your products. But having said that, I completely agree with Manfred about listening to your team on the ground, whoever they might be. That is your first point of entry is listening to your distributors, listening to your licensees, listening to the team that you're building on the ground. Um, as a foreigner, I'll be the first person, even after 18 years, I know less than my own team. I will always know less than my own team. And I mean, adding to this, to this setup, because as Christina rightly said, very often that's how you start if you're going through a reseller, if you're going through a distributor, don't just listen to what they say, look at what they do. You know, that's very basic. And rule. combine that with your own data. Exactly. Don't always rely on one medium for, look, for data. Look at what they do. Um, and then, I mean, at the end of the day, if you're going through resellers, it's kind of a an up or out thing, right? So either they're doing a good job and you grow together with them, or they're really lousy in terms of their performance, and then you need to eliminate. I'm, I'm pretty sure Christina has a, a webinar recording somewhere on kind of the details of that one, but just one thing to say at that point here in terms of the resellers, be careful on the geographical region that you give them, meaning just Beijing, just Shanghai, or all of China. And also be careful kind of on giving them exclusivity on a certain number of years. That sort of thing gets you stuck very early on if you don't kind of do it in a 
well thought out and kind of um, well coordinated type of way. All right, in terms of the recipe um, for the competitors, you know, differentiate between the competitors, international ones and local ones. That is important, differentiate. You know, don't come in and say, oh, we only have that other one European competitor in China. Um, that is the European perspective. That is not the perspective from your Chinese customer. So look at those two things and make a list of them, you know, and make sure that you write stuff down about them when you learn more about them. You know, don't just take the name that that's not good enough. In terms of accepting reality, um, all the successful organizations out there I've seen, all their leaders, the ones caring about China, and I'm not talking about the top man in China, I'm talking about the top person in that organization responsible for the Chinese market. If they're successful, they all have that trait that they actually develop a certain level of understanding on the Chinese market. And most of the people who failed, they never started. That is definitely one of the crucial things. Um, in terms of pricing, obviously, you know, get an idea, you know, get an idea on the range, um, get an idea on the competitors. Your resellers should help, your local sales team should help. Um, you know, you just need to figure that out. If you don't have that, you're, you're completely blind trying to drive at 150 miles an hour, you know, that it's not a good idea. Um, you know, Something that you can also play very well in China is especially kind of if you come with that European premium approach or with a product that's that's um, kind of first hand. Look at industry verticals, you know, your competitors might have cheaper prices, they might be great at this or that, but you know, you might be able to beat them in an industry where you have 10 years, 20 years of experience and they don't. So, you know, differentiate, look at the details. Um, and just, you know, one, one more thing, and then I think I'm, I'm, I'm good. Um, look at the way you sell. You know, it's not always in China that you say, look, there's these 20 arguments, these 20 things why my product is great, and that's how you sell. There's many different ways, you know. We could have our own webinar just about that kind of topic alone. Uh, but that is important, you know, don't, don't just kind of think there is these arguments and that's how, how I sell. Um, you need to be a bit more, more creative on that kind of, on that kind of thing. Oops, sorry. Christina, back to you. Just unmute myself. So I think we're going to leave today's session there. Um, if anybody has any questions, put them in the chat box just to finish off. Data can come from a variety of different sources. Manfred and I are not here to sell any of that. We don't provide data research, but we know how fundamental it is. I do a benchmarking analysis of my own competitors every two years. I look at their pricing. I look at their portfolio of services. I see what, how we differ, how they differ. I do this for my own knowledge level to understand how the market is developing and how my competitors are developing. So everybody needs to do this exercise in terms of competitor benchmarking, price benchmarking, et cetera. You need to analyze who your customers are. You have to be able to niche. Um, and I wanna use the word niche because the market is not 1.3 billion people. Your market is going to be small, start small. Have a vision to start small, to then expand, to grow, to then scale, all right? If you start off thinking 1.3 billion people is your market, it's so overwhelming and daunting just the thought of that, okay? Start small, think about how you can segment and say, you know what, in year one, I want to re retain, I don't know, three, four, five customers, and then I will build off on that. So who are these three customers? Who are these five customers? And are they going to be recurring customers? Because what you also want is, stability. So start small. Do not think of grandiose things. You're going to get nowhere and you're not even going to convince your board <laughs> to get the project approved. All right. Um, in terms of a value position, uh, proposition, know where you fit into the market. Understand where you are fitting in. And 
one thing that I've learned in the last three years of this pandemic is you have to be flexible. Manfred already mentioned that. If you're not flexible, you're not going to get anywhere. You have to be ready to pivot at a moment's notice. How do you pivot? It's with the data that you have at your fingertips. A big mistake companies make is that they spend a fortune on market research that, I don't know, McKinsey has done, and they spend half a million dollars on that. And they have these beautiful PowerPoint presentations that tell you everything at that moment in time for China, for your industry and sector. But I can tell you that beautiful PowerPoint presentation will not reflect what is happening three months down the line or six months down the line. Who would have ever have thought that a city like Shanghai would have been shut down for 10 weeks? Nobody could have predicted that. It literally happened overnight. I think if, if I may add, Christina, I think if you take that the budget, whatever your budget for market research is, you know, kind of take maximum a third or take 20% kind of for the upfront and then take the other 80% for the ongoing, you know, yes. that, that's, that's kind of really where, where you need to, to be because be it the pandemic, be it COVID, be it political topics, be it, you know, just market forces, um, it's 8,000, 9,000, 10,000 kilometers away from you if you're kind of, you know, measuring it from Europe. Uh, you need to find a way, a system essentially, kind of, you know, to, to take the pulse continuously. Um, and uh, that's what Christina and me are here for. Um, at that point of time, let me also kind of shortly highlight the, the quick strategy workshop. Christina and me said there will be three quick strategy workshops that we offer to participants of this webinar for free. Normally, uh, they come at quite a, quite a price tag. Um, what is the quick strategy workshop? The idea really is kind of to say, let's sit together. Let's take about 90 minutes of each other's time to kind of map where do we want to be in three years down the line in China. Three years, we found out, is a very, very good timeline to, you know, uh, make a bit of a bold move, make a bit of a bold plan, but then also to later on break it down into a detailed one-year plan and then to keep, you know, relentlessly executing on this one. So um, there's three that we offer for the participants of this webinar and uh, those that reach out to Christina first, uh, first one, come first come, first serve. Um, Christina, if you want to add something on this one? Yeah, I mean, again, I mean, uh, Matt and I are going to reiterate this throughout the week. We are big believers in execution. And sometimes people need help to understand how they should be executing and what steps should be considered a priority. So again, we're offering three free slots. Um, each slot is 90 minutes for this quick strategy workshop where we go looking at where you are today, where do you want to be in three years, and what are what is the execution plan that you can implement step by step within those three years? Um, and the idea is that all decision makers should be on that call because. Although one of you might be on here representing your company today, there might be multiple people who are decision makers and they need to be joining in to actually make decisions, guys. This is also a new, new you know, a key step in this whole process. Um, just to finish off on the market research, there are a lot, a lot of companies who offer market research analyses and you're not paying exorbitant prices like you are with McKinsey. Um, there are also, if you are in the consumer uh, side of um, your, your, your target market are consumers, um, you can find a lot of data through the e-commerce platforms. You can also find a lot of current data. Um, there's a company that I collaborate with called Bolt Insight, where they do focus trends and they give the data current through an app. It's, it's, it's fantastic technology um, in terms of how they do that. So there are companies out there, again, Manfred and I don't provide this type of research at all, um, but we do know companies who do offer it and we'd be happy to, to refer you on to them um, so that you can have a conversation with them about how you can maintain these recurring, recurring research uh, analyses. Um, I cannot, cannot emphasize more how important data is. And from a financial perspective, how important it is to analyze your financial data from day one of transacting with China all the way through your whole China journey so that you've got a history that's available to you. And that obviously has to come from your own finance team 
um, back home in your home jurisdiction, especially if you don't yet have a subsidiary in China. Um, so that's, that's day one, basically. Um, I don't think any questions have popped in thus far, uh, but if you do have any questions, um, you can try to, I can try to unmute you. Um, so I'm allowing everybody to unmute themselves. Um, so if you want, if you do have a question and you want to raise it, just unmute yourself and, and you can ask away. I think Mary's got one. Yes, I have that one. I'm a new company. Uh, I'm used to sign to enter China. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can yeah. hear you. Right. Um, sorry, I had to come into this late and I only just realized, but uh, I have a new company. It's just brand new signed in to enter China. It's an app, educational app, uh, not machine generated translations. It's by educationists in each subject. Is there any, I know you've given so much advice here. Do you have a recording? Will it be sent out afterwards? Yes, we are recording today and everybody will get a recording. Um, as soon as it goes through the Zoom system, I'll send out the, the link for the recording. Right, would somebody like me be okay to apply for one of those places, the three places, when I'm just a new company starting out? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Mary, I'll send you an email afterwards. Is that all right, please? Yeah. We've got so much organized. We've got dot coms, dot cns. We've got so many things done that way on our LinkedIn, other social medias and all. But it is scary. <laughs> it's so, <laughs> so scary. It's don't worry, scary. we're here, Mary. <laughs> what, sorry? I said, don't worry, we're, we're here, you know. It doesn't need <laughs> to be you, scary. Thank you. I lived in China for four years. So this is where my idea came from. And I really enjoy it. I enjoy working with Chinese people and everything. I work internationally. But uh, thank you very much for saying that. So, Mary, um, Mary, I would, I, like, I would just like to delve a little bit deeper and maybe you can share a little bit your concerns. Why are you, why is it scary? Well, okay. So I don't know how many are on this call, but I, I'll tell you why it's scary because I, I, I know and I work there, things are copied so easily. Right. Yes. I also know that's one of the big things. I've very much got strong branding and trademarks and all are pretty much established in all different places. China has been a minefield with translations, even though we tra have Chinese translators, uh, even the trademark person tr translated it wrong. Her name is Academic Fish. And when it went forward, he had translated it for fishing rather than fishing, which meant it was, so that was more money. It's just continual, it's a lot of output there financially for somebody, an SME like myself starting out, right. and all mm. the money's going there. Also establishing the contract with, uh, I don't want to say it, just I can tell you in the email, for the business partner that would work for you to launch in China. Mm. We had signed the contract and then we heard there's changes to the Chinese legislation. I mean, the two days later, so we had to do more changes. So that means more solicitors' fees, more. Oh, it is so, a heavy commitment. So I would, I would, I, I would like to. I mean, this is going to come in tomorrow's session. Um, but just to say, uh, China isn't cheap, guys. Yeah, no, it's not. <laughs> uh, and and I will be talking about it in tomorrow's session regarding the financial budget aspect of things. Um, but just to highlight, China is no longer a cheap country. It is a place where you have to have a concrete budget with a buffer for situations like Mary has gone through That's where it. mistakes can happen. And, uh, you know, mistakes, misunderstandings, however you want to call it, can happen. Um, and of course, it, it, uh, the fear starts developing the minute you start spending extra money that you hadn't really budgeted for. Um, uh, and it's kind of then is becomes a dry force of thinking, what, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> am I actually doing what I, what I should be doing? Am I going in the right direction? Um, but Mary, we, we can have that quick strategy workshop with you um, to, to go through everything just one-to-one -one and, and in detail. Um, that would be really amazing. Um, how, do you, how do people, I know there's other people probably asking how to apply for it. I mean, I've got your name and everything. Uh, it's Is just it's just to email me. I hadn't actually shared, I'll finish my presentation. Um, oh, sorry. Now that I'm, I'm <laughs> You can email me. You, you can email me um, and Manfred at um, Christina at woodburnglobal.com if you want to just take a photo of that, guys. I'm also going to put it in the chat. Or Manfred, can you? I'm just typing it in. Both okay. Fine. Thank you. Um, put it in the chat box there. Um, and 
very, very similar to Mary's story about going into China and developing the business. You know, again, knowledge is power. Uh, when I first arrived in 2002, the amount of mistakes that we did going into the market, and I mean, in retrospect, the dumbest mistakes, but we did not know better. Okay, I didn't have an ecosystem of people helping me. I thought I could do it on my own. Um, coming from Hong Kong, you think that you just emulate what you do in Hong Kong and it can be emulated in China. That was a huge mistake. So it, it's, it's a huge learning curve. And for me, you know, my, my motivation and my ambition when I'm working with clients is that we can minimize, I say minimize because it's not possible to completely avoid all obstacles, but it's minimizing the amount of roadblocks and obstacles that come along the way. Um, uh, you know, it took me almost five years to be able to scale up uh, and grow the organization because I just, I didn't have the right foundation for the business. And I mean, if, if I can add here at that point, Christina, um, and that's mainly to, to the audience out there. One of the reasons why I, I really cherish and enjoy this cooperation with, with Christina is that, you know, she's, she's good at what she's doing. Um, how can that be useful for, for everybody out here is really, you know, when it comes to budgets or when it comes to thinking about, you know, um, who, who do I want to have as kind of financial advisor? You know, take everybody you have, but I would suggest think about adding Christina. She's got a very good sense for that. Um, she's, she's got her own company on the ground, same as I do. Um, but she's got that kind of, you know, approach that, especially when you're starting up, it will help you. So, you know, approach her on that kind of service, no matter what stage you are, because what happens so often, and again, this is the Mallorca syndrome with China, is that, you know, something happens, something goes wrong, then the explanation on the Chinese side will be, yeah, yeah, but that's China, you know, that's, that's how things are here. And then kind and of- And I this, cannot uh, stand hearing that anymore. Exactly. And then you blow your budget for 20, 30, 40, 50%. And you keep that doing a couple of times and you've, you know, very effectively kind of created your own financial black hole. So, you know, go talk to Christina, um, go see kind of how your structure looks like and, and that sort of stuff. Um, that would so, be so my this recommendations is, here. Uh, this is where Manfred and I complement each other very much because our service portfolio is very different one to the other, but we, you, can't live without each other, if you will. Um, so Manfred is fantastic at firefighting, firefighting, um, building an ecosystem of people, finding those people that are the right fit for you with a Western mindset, but are local. Um, uh, nobody can go to China and do it alone. You need to have that ecosystem that's readily available. And again, that's day three. So just to highlight, um, you know, we are going to be talking about that. The fundamentals for this three-day workshop is really looking at data. Um, I actually generally don't talk to clients unless they've got data. I think Manfred, you're the same. Um, you know, unless you have got market research data available and you can answer our questions about where you see the opportunities in China and where you're going to move forward. You know, otherwise you're too too early in the game to talk to actually anybody yet. You have nothing concrete um, to share. Uh, tomorrow, like I said, just to reiterate, tomorrow we're going to be talking about business models. What can you, can you not do? What are the financial resources? Wednesday, empowering ecosystem of people. And session four is really, there's no slides. We are there to communicate with the audience about the next three action plans within the next 90 days. All right. Um, and Mary, I'm going to email you directly. Um, I'll have your email address from the registration list about the uh, setting up the quick strategy workshop and I'll put Manfred in, in copy on that email as well. All right. And also so, um, for, for, for everybody, you know, try and use this, this, this week to, to kind of get stuff done and also make sure that there's to do. Um, yes, you know, knowledge is power, but you really need to execute and, uh, you know, um, the earlier you can get going, the better. So please yeah. create your to-dos and uh, thank you very much exactly. for taking the time and for yeah. being with us. Um, we cherish that opportunity as well. In theory, the three action plans should be an action plan per session. 
So what's your action plan after today's session? That is the question for everybody. What will you do with the knowledge you have gained from today? What do you still, what have you done? What do you still have to do? Um, and, then, and then we'll work from there for Thursday. Session. The convenient thing on our end is as we're speakers, we can you know, answer this question with, we have lunch. Yes. <laughs> 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 All right, everybody. We look forward to seeing you again tomorrow at 10 a.m. Central European time. That's 9 a.m. British Standard Time, 4 p.m. China time. Um, and again, for those of you that are watching from China, happy national holidays and thank you for participating with us today uh, during, during the holidays. All Thanks right. so much, everybody. Take Bye. care. See you tomorrow. Bye.